Today we're going to be closing out a sermon series called I Do. And we've been following a, spe a specific marriage ceremony um, from the Galileans. The Galileans are from northern Israel. Jesus was a Galilean. So were his disciples. And there was a unique, different way in which they practiced their marriage ceremony. One of the greatest uniqueness about the Galileans' wedding was that the woman or the bride had the choice to choose the acceptance of the proposal. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. I'll set you up so that we can go ahead and engage in today's topic, which is on the door. Genesis chapter 7, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Noah, go into the ark, you and all your household, for I have seen that you are righteous before me, in this generation verse 11 in the 600th year of Noah's life in the second month on the 17th day of the month on that day all the fountains of the great deep burst forth and the windows of heaven were open and rain fell upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights the very same day Noah and his sons Shem and Ham and Japheth and Noah's wife and the three wives of his son sons with them entered the ark they and every beast according to its kind and all the livestock according to their kind and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth according to its kind and every bird according to its kind every winged creature they went into the ark with Noah two and two of all flesh in which they were the breath of life verse 16 and those that entered, male and female, of all flesh, went in as God has commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. I want you to repeat after me. Your word is written in my mind. Your word is hidden in my heart. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light for my path. I will seek you with all. My strength, I choose to live my life according to your word. Your word, O oh Lord, is eternal. You may be seated. So we kicked off the sermon series, I Do, with the beginning stages of the proposal. Pretty much what happens is, is that the man would go before the woman, the groom would go before the bride and ask the bride to marry him. And the way they would do that is they would give a cup. Today we know it as a ring. They would give a, they would give a cup over to the woman. The woman would then decide by either drinking it or giving the cup back. If she drank the cup, he would then drink the cup. And that was the very first steps of the proposal. So drinking the cup, giving the cup back was accepting the proposal. Following that, the male would go ahead and begin to prepare a room, a feast that's going to take place following the ceremony. And after the ceremony, there will be a celebration. So the, the man will begin to prepare a place for the party while the bride would go and she would buy clothing so that she can prepare a dress we talked about wearing Christ that is it's important that we ought to wear Christ and in the process of that that we need to consistently remain in Christ last week we talked about the night it is in the night that we know that unexpected things happen the Bible teaches us that Christ is gonna come like a thief in the night a thief, not necessarily meaning he's going to steal something from us, but unexpectedly. It's going to happen suddenly. So when you look at the history of the Galileans, the father was the only one that knew when that day will come. So you had the groom that was waiting for the father to tap the shoulder to say, go ahead and pick up your bride. You had the bride that was preparing and remaining prepared, waiting for the groom to come. This is all parallel to Christ's coming. That we, you and I know that Christ is going to return. 
The Bible says that a thousand years is like a day and a day is like a thousand years to God. In other words, our timetable and God's timetable is in two different spectrums. I know every single day and for many years, some of us, we have heard that Christ is coming back soon. That is true. Though we know the season of which he is coming back, we don't know the day nor the hour. Well, last week I ended talking about five foolish versions and five wise versions. Five wise versions that were prepared for the groom. The, they were prepared and they went with him to the marriage feast. And the Bible says that the door was closed. While the foolish versions who were unprepared, they were seeking to join the rest in the marriage feast. They were left outside the door with Jesus. And this is what Jesus responded. Truly I say to you, I do not know you. So you have different narratives and different scenarios that are going on in which and why people don't make it to this feast. A door provides access in. It is security to also keep people out. If I don't want you inside my house, I would keep the door closed and I will also make sure that the door is locked. If I don't want you to see what's on the inside, I would also close the door and keep it locked. That's like the closet. But when you hear people talk about the closet, that's because people like to hide secret things so that other people who are walking around in the house does not see what's in the closet. So they will lock it up. They will put it in a hiding place. In the Galilean wedding, when the father tells the son, it is time, the sound of a shofar, which is a trumpet, is what awakens the bride that the groom is coming. This is the moment they have been waiting for. And as the groom arrives and all the bridesmaids and guests that are there, they become witnesses. And the, bi and, and the history teaches us that they would then pick up the bride. They would lift her up into the air and they would carry her over to the feast. Now the Galileans, they called it flying the bride to the father's house. This is parallel to 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, when it says, Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up. I want you to say caught up. That caught up is rapture. You will never see the word rapture, but caught up means that we would be caught up in the air. And the Bible says, with them into the clouds to do what? To meet with the Lord. And so we would always be, we would forever be with the Lord. Those who are with the Lord have made it in. Those who have been left behind, watch this now, are shut out. Let me ask you a question here today. Have you ever been shut out? Have you ever forgotten your keys and you couldn't get in? I remember there was a moment I was coming back from a retreat. It was late at night, so usually our retreats would happen from Friday through Sunday, right? So some of us will return on Sunday, but since I was preaching on Sunday, I would return Saturday night, and it would be in the midnight hour. So one night, I was headed home, and, and I realized that I didn't have my keys. Now, my family was home, but they were sleeping. I was calling but there was no response. I was literally locked out of my own house. I, I tried to um, find an unlocked window, but everything was locked. I would ring the doorbell, but there was no response. I would knock on the door, but no one replied. And I kept on and kept on, and it took about an hour before my wife responded. I want to tell you here today that when you are shut out, when you are on the outside, when Christ returns, there is nothing that you can do at that point to get back in. You can try to find any cracks of every window. You can try to knock. You can try to find your way in and out to get yourself on the inside. But the reality is you and I are at the mercy of the one who's on the inside. Well, I got some good news for some of you here today that the door is open today and it has not yet officially been locked. We're all at the mercy of our God. 
When you look at the ways of God, he never shuts people out. People are the ones that shut God out. He don't shut people out. He shuts, or, or we shut God out. It's funny how sometimes in the predicaments that we're in, we find ourselves blaming God for what we did. In the story of Noah, we, were, we know that many, many people died. I mean, many people died. A whole generation has gone because they were shut out from being in the ark. Genesis chapter 6, verse 12, I want you to follow me here. The Bible says that God saw how corrupted the world was because the people had corrupted their ways. What you and I have got to recognize is that it was not God that corrupted the world. It is man that has corrupted the world. For some of us who feel as if, is God there? Does God see what's happening? My answer to you is absolutely God sees what's happening. God saw it in the days of Noah and God sees it today. In verse 13, God mentions it, it because of the people. This is what he says. Because of the people, the world is full of violence. You want to look at the violence that is happening all around us? That is not God's fault. Matter of fact, when God created us, he created us in his image. He created us with a pure heart. It is when we have activated the sin that is within us that now we've allowed things to filter our heart. Violence comes and it stands from the wickedness that resonates in our hearts. So now, when God looked at Noah, he didn't see in anyone else what he saw in Noah. It is in Genesis chapter 6 verse 9 before the flood, Noah is seen as a righteous man. He's around 480 years old. How many 480 year olds do we have here right now? Can you imagine? Can you imagine being 480 years old? In Genesis 7 1, right before the flood, God saw Noah again, watch this now, as righteousness. He saw. So even amongst the wit wickedness, I want to tell you, God is looking for righteousness. Noah is 600 years old. The gap of years in between Genesis 6, 9 to Genesis 7, 1 was 120 years. Are you with me? 120 years of opportunity for people to get their life right, yet they shut God out. Did you hear what I just said? 120 years has gone by before God even releases a drop of rain. You know, the scripture doesn't clearly state that Noah warned the people about the flood. Yet, scriptures does teach us in 2 Peter 2, 5, that he was a preacher of righteousness. Which means you and I can assume that as he is building the ark, he's also preaching righteousness. That as he is building the ark, he's also letting people know to help him building the ark because the wrath of God is coming. God will not bring wrath, listen to me now, without opportunity to repent. God is giving this nation an opportunity to repent. God is giving individuals opportunity to repent. That's why I tell you that even though hell may be happening around us, it doesn't mean that hell needs to be happening inside of you. Matthew 24, 37, for as were the days of Noah, watch this now, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. I want to tell you, New Life Covenant, we are living the last days. I want to tell you, New Life Covenant, so are the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. What does that mean? Do you see wickedness? Do you see violence? Do you see hatred? Do you see bitterness? The days of Noah is upon us and God says, when you see it, then the Son of Man shall be coming soon. God is so graceful that he always allows the in-between to happen before the judgment. What do you mean? In other words, he lays down the penalty but leaves room for repentance. 
He lets you and I know already the end of the book has already been written. The Bible, the 66 books in the Bible has already been written. The penalties of our actions have already been written. Which means is that he's already laid down the penalty of those who have a heart that is unrepented. God does not fool anybody. God does not try to deceive anybody. Or he does not deceive anybody. God does not manipulate anybody. What's black is black. What's white is white. I want to tell you, when God calls sin, he calls sin a sin. A big lie or a small lie is still a lie. Half the cross said lie, half the cross say sin, and everybody is correct. It is still a lie, and it is also still a sin. God is so graceful that he still gives us the playbook. He still gives us the game plan, but he leaves room for repentance. I mean, Scripture even says things like we will, we will fall short of the glory of God. In other words, God already expects failure. God already expects shortcomings. Please don't use that as a license to do sin. Because when you use that as a license to do sin, then what you're doing is you're taking the grace of God for granted. You're taking advantage of the grace of God. Grace is our escape and grace is only possible because of his mercy. You can't have mercy without grace and you can't have grace without mercy. Because I want to tell you, it is God's mercy that removes the wrath that we deserve. And it is God's grace that gives us what we don't deserve. Mercy and grace works together. So I'm going to give it to you the way that I can understand it. I want to break it down to you so that you can see it the way that I see it. When we look at this, this makes absolutely no sense. This makes no sense. What, 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 does, what does that mean? What that means is our lives without God is messy. Our lives without God is not clear. When you begin to understand and when the truth begins to reveal itself in your life, you can now begin to tackle the very things that the enemy is trying to confuse you of. Foolishness, which entitles wickedness and being unprepared. Wickedness are people that are immoral. People that don't care what the word of God says. People who create their own convictions. People who create their own ideology. People who create their own doctrine. Foolishness are people that are wicked. People in the times of Noah, they were wicked. People in the time of Sodom and Gomorrah, they were wicked. We got a lot of people that are wicked. And can I be honest with you? All of us at one time or another, we have acted upon wickedness. So foolishness is either wickedness or being unprepared. The five versions. You got five that were prepared and five that were not prepared. They had all the resources. They had all the tools. Matter of fact, they journeyed together to meet the groom. But yet when it was time, when Jesus Christ came, when they went to the feast so that they can party, the five that were not wise, the five that were foolish, they were at the store and they were buying oil for the lamp when the wise already had extra oil in case if the lamp begins to dim. So what do we read? The Bible says that the foolish were at the doorstep. Follow me here. They were at the doorstep and wow the five wise and all the guests that were invited to the party was celebrating with the groom you've got the five foolish that is saying I'm ready now 
And yet Jesus says, I don't, I don't know who you are. I want you to understand what Jesus means because so many people, they're saying, well, how is it that Jesus... No, no, no. See, you don't understand. What Jesus is trying to tell you and I is that I don't know who you've become. I don't know who you've become. But who you've become is not allowed at the banquet. Who you become, the character, the lifestyle, I know this is a tough word, but the truth is what's going to set you and I free. That is not going to be accepted in here. So foolishness, which is wickedness and unprepared. Come over here and come over here. Lift it up. With no grace. Foolishness with no grace. In other words, God is nowhere near you. This is a man or a woman that has a heart that has not repented. Uh, this is a man or a woman that is unprepared. We, we know what unprepared means. Unprepared means you don't take God serious and you don't take yourself serious. Unprepared means you don't take the word of God serious. You know the word of God, but you're allowing laziness to trump you. I, I'll wait till tomorrow. I, I'll wait till tomorrow. Foolishness with no grace, with no God. Foolishness with no grace, no God. You know what that leads you to? It leads you to destruction. Can I tell you that even when foolishness feels good and even when foolishness brings you money, it would never end up promising. It would always lead you to destruction. Even when your selfishness that, that you feel or think qualifies you to respond and act in such a way, it will lead you to destruction. There is never no good that can ever take place in your foolishness. But what happens when you invite God? What takes place when you invite God into your life? Let me show you. God never comes by himself. But God begins to embody every need that you and I have. This is why God says, I am the God of I am. I am the God of your needs. I am the God that can fulfill your every desire. So when you invite God, watch this now, you can't have grace without mercy. That's why it is by God's mercy. It is by the mercy of God that gives you the access for you to keep moving forward. It is the mercy of God that allows, watch this, your foolishness. Because foolishness does not change. How many of y'all know that we're fools? That our foolishness, right, does not limit us from receiving the grace that God has for us. So by God's mercy, when you invite them in, foolishness with grace, when you have a heart of repentance, when you are preparing yourself for the coming of Christ, it leads to redemption. Do you see how this works? By God's mercy, foolishness with grace, leads to redemption so what happens with the grace of God with the grace of God it begins to cover the foolishness of your life by God's grace by God's mercy with grace leads to redemption I want to tell you by the mercy of God and by the grace of God his, our sins have been covered and that is not going to keep us from celebrating at the banquet. You and I have the access in because of his mercy, because of his grace. Do you know that the ark that Noah built is a symbol of grace? You know what that means? What that means is that by God's mercy, God gave Noah the grace to build the ark. God gave Noah the skill, the strength, the wisdom. Have you ever asked yourself, well, how am I going to do it? 
When God told Noah to build the ark, God gave Noah the resources. I want to tell you today that when God asks of you and I to do something, it is our responsibility to make sure that even though we don't know how it's going to get done, but that we would walk by faith. Because when you walk by faith, then you will see the mercies of God. You will see the door that will open in your life. You don't know where it came from. Why? Because it is the mercy of God. Through His grace, grace carries you. So not only would God give you the resource, but like Noah, you're going to be riding in your grace. While everybody is in the outside and they are dying, you're going to be riding your grace. While everybody's in the outside and their life is being led into destruction, you are going to be redeemed and you're going to be riding in your grace. And how many of us are praying that for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So not only was Noah in the ark, but Noah's wife was in his ark. Not only was his wife in the ark, but Noah's children was in his ark. And not only was Noah's children in the ark, but Noah's children's wife were in the ark. And Noah's children's wife, children were in the ark. I want to tell you today that the grace of God will carry you through generation to generation to generation. You guys can come off stage. It's by the grace. The grace is our escape of God's wrath. Those who were shut out, they died. And instead of receiving of God's mercy, they felt his wrath. Ephesians 2 8 says it this way, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. The grace that is extended to us is a gift. It is by grace through faith in Jesus that we are saved. You can't be out of the ark and be saved. When the flood comes, the ark has to be built. I mean, grace, it is fueled by obedience and this God told Noah two things God told Noah Noah I want you to build the ark and Noah I want you to enter the ark I believe that God is telling us two things here today New Life Covenant I want you to build your faith I want you to build your faith and New Life Covenant I want you to enter your grace I want you to build your faith and I want you to enter your grace because it is the grace that's going to sustain you it is the grace that's going to get you through. Have you ever sat back and told yourself, how am I going to do it? It is the grace of God that's going to get you through it. How am I going to overcome it? It is the grace of God that you're going to overcome it. Have you ever woke up one morning and you don't even know how you were able to get through the night? Can I, can I tell you how it was the grace of God? It was the grace of God. Build your faith and enter your grace that once you're in, God, watch this now, will shut the door behind you. He will shut the door behind you. This is what God told Noah. Then the Lord shut him in. It was the Lord that shut him in. Everything now that is on the outside, that would get destroyed. Can you imagine with me for a moment? That the door is now closed. And all you hear is people in the outside saying, please let me in. And everything that is in the outside is cries of people begging to be in the inside. Asking for the mercy of God. Asking for the mercy of God when the mercy of God was relevant for 120 years. Asking for the mercy of God when every single day you and I wake up and we have breath in our lungs. Asking for the mercy of God. But you know what the enemy wants to do to you and I? The enemy wants to shift our perspective. And instead of looking at what it is, we want to blame God for what it is. And when that happens, we would find ourselves on the outskirts asking to get in. But I've got good news for you. 
the door is not closed. It is open. In a wedding party, when you're about to get married, you would RSVP. You would RSVP. The intent is for you to invite people to be a part of your wedding, people you love, people you've grown with, people that you want to celebrate with. So you would send out the invitations, and according to those who have responded off the RSVP, will then have a seat at the table. Have you ever been to a wedding? Maybe this is your story where you had a host that was in front checking the list of those that RSVP, and then someone shows up to your wedding. The invitation was sent, but they never replied. And then they want to be a part of the wedding, maybe because they knew the bride and they knew the groom, so they figured, why do I have to RSVP? I know who they are. And the moment that they're in the front, the host looks at them and looks at the list and tells them, you're not on the list. Your name is not written on this list. And the individuals are there and they're getting upset because they know the bride and the groom. Can I tell you here today, the devil knows who Jesus is. It's not about who you know. The devil knows God himself. Matter of fact, he probably knows them better than you and I. Do you know what Revelation 2015 says? And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. All right, let's park there for a second, and I close. Why are we mad at God if he's already laid down the playbook? What you and I got to recognize is that when God created hell, he never created hell so that human beings can live in there. When God created hell, he created so that the serpent, the deceiver, the liar, the manipulator, Lucifer, Satan, can be thrown and casted and that he would be there forever. God created hell so that all the demons that are now agents of the enemy can be thrown into the lake of fire. Hell was never created for human beings. But the truth is, Hell is open for those who shut God out. Amen. We're not there yet because the door is still open. If you hear me, that's very good news. God has sent an RSVP and all he's asking is, are you going to reply? Or are you going to reject the invitation? Would you stand to your feet? I want to do two calls here before we end our time together. I want to do two calls because I believe that there are people that need to make a covenant with God. Door still open and God is saying, come just as you are. Come with your foolishness. Come with your wickedness. My grace is sufficient for you. For those of you who think that your wrongdoings still needs to be worked out before you go into God, that is the wrong thinking. God can help you. And he doesn't work from the outside in. He works from the inside out. So I want to make a salvation call. But I also want to make a call so that we can have agents for the kingdom of God. I want to make a call for ambassadors of Jesus Christ. What do I mean? What I mean is that Noah was building the ark, preparing their escape. Preparing their escape from death. But in the 120 years before he was in the ark, he was a preacher of righteousness. I want to commission you to be a preacher of righteousness, to be an ambassador of Jesus Christ. I am not saying just to invite them in church because that may be too late. What I'm saying is that you take an opportunity and ask God that there will be a divine appointment for you this week so that you can bring G somebody to Jesus Christ. That you can pray with somebody right then and there. Because new life, new life at home, tomorrow the Bible says is not promised. And we have got to begin to rise up and understand 
God is looking for some agents. He is looking for preachers of righteousness. He is looking that in the midst of chaos, that in the midst of wickedness, that in the midst of violence, who is going to stand out like Noah? I am praying the anointing of Noah upon your life so that you can be a preacher and tell the story of Jesus. If you're in this room, you want to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I want you to lift up your hands and say, I want to enter that door. I have ran from God. I have hid from God. I have shut God out. I want you to open up that door. And I want you to know that Jesus says, my grace is sufficient for you. For those of you that are here, you're saying, I need to be a preacher of righteousness. That this week, God, I want to have a divine appointment so that I can share your truth in someone's life worship is going to lead us if that is you online if that's you in the, in the person come out of your seats and meet me at this altar don't be afraid don't be shy but respond no to the call of god done, no matter where I've been, no matter how come on respond to the call of god I need preachers of righteousness. Come on. I need agents to respond. I need ambassadors that are fear afraid. For me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I pray over my children. Come on. I'm building the ark so that my children can ride in grace with me. I am determined. I am determined. Blessing over your family. Come on now. The curse shall be broken. The 
curse of suicide shall be broken the curse of divorce shall be broken the curse of drug addiction shall be broken i pray a generational blessing i pray grace ride you right now i pray grace would ride you and that everything that dies should die on the outside i pray that you would build your ark and that you would enter your ark and that you would flow with god that you know that by god's mercy and by god's grace he would carry you through Jesus has given me when I lift my voice and shout every wall comes crashing down I have the authority Jesus has Come on, you don't given go alone. me you don't go alone. when I open up my mouth miracles start
is with us. If you believe that, I need you to clap your hands in the building. Come on, I need you to clap your hands. If you're online, I need you to clap your hands. And I need you to receive.